On December 7, 1941, most Americans were enjoying their day, oblivious to what was going on in the world. Hitler and his Nazi thugs were Europe's problem. This important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese had celebrated this attack. It was victory. There was no way America would enter the war now. The only man who did not celebrate was the one who planned the attack on Pearl Harbor. Admiral Yamamoto would write later in his diary, I fear all that we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. These prophetic words would come back to haunt him. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. America had officially joined the war. If you shoot at us, we'll shoot you back. The United States, along with its allies, were about to give Nazi Germany, the Empire of Japan, and Italy not the beating they needed, but the one they deserved. From September 1940 to May 1941, Hitler ordered relentless nighttime bombing raids against London and other British cities. The plan was to demoralize the British people. Hitler could not have been more wrong. In 1943, the Royal Air Force would return the favor. They began their own nighttime bombing campaign against German cities, the likes of which had never been seen before. Hitler's first mistake was underestimating the United Kingdom's Royal Air Force. Hitler's second mistake was sending his precious German Luftwaffe up against the Royal Air Force. Blinded by arrogance, Hitler kept sending his planes up the Royal Air Force was more than happy to shoot him out of the sky. This is the part of the story where it gets weird. The returning German pilots would report to high command about these strange glowing balls of light that would fly in formation with them. The German pilots were afraid of these fiery balls of light. They would fly in formation and maneuver like they were going to hit the aircraft. A German ace reported back to high command, it must be a new weapon the Allies have. 
At the same time, British and American pilots were reporting seeing these strange balls of light that would maneuver in and out of their formation. One British pilot described them looking like Christmas lights. They were flying around, and they were being intelligently controlled. After so many pilots were reporting seeing these strange balls of light flying in and out of their formation, the Allies thought this must be a weapon that Hitler has developed. One American pilot reported, they show up in many different sizes. They're definitely intelligently controlled and they glow a fiery red, sometimes yellow, white, and even blue. Another American pilot reported, sometimes these strange balls of light will be about the size of a baseball, sometimes as big as a basketball, and someone or something is flying these things. Reports kept coming in from pilots. The objects flew alongside aircraft at 200 miles an hour and often outmaneuvered the aircraft they were chasing. These strange balls of light would never show up on radar. During the war, the pilots gave these objects a name. There was a cartoon that was popular at the time called Smokey Stover. The pilots called these balls of light Foo Fighters. Well over 70 years later, people are still seeing these Foo Fighters. Not in the sky, but on the ground. What are these Foo Fighters, and why are we seeing them today? It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that, that shocked me. They don't make people that, that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. Hi, this is Carol King from Music City, and you're listening to my favorite podcast, Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight, kind of continuing our theme of the Foo Fighters. And I played that last night for the members. I'm really fascinated by these Foo Fighters. It's kind of a quick history lesson of where that name comes from and and what they actually are. I think people today think it's a band, uh, which it is. Great band, by the way. Uh, But the Foo Fighters that we're talking about tonight refers to the Balls of Light. And we're going to be chatting with Jeff tonight. Jeff's actually from California. He's a retired police officer. And he captured these strange balls of light flying around on his property. 
him and his wife sat there and watched him on their security system. And I'm going to ask Jeff, too, after being a police officer for so many years, uh, what is there a bizarre call or a strange event that happened to him? And his answer might surprise you. Uh, we're also going to be chatting with Bo, uh, Bo Kennedy from the Bump Podcast. And Bo's going to be sharing his personal accounts and talk a little bit about his podcast tonight. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Jeff to the show. Jeff, thanks for coming on. Uh, You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me, Wes. Yeah, absolutely. And I was really fascinated by your email. I read through the whole thing about this strange encounter with a light on your property. And uh, I know you're a retired police officer. Thank you again for your service. You know, it's weird, Jeff, with these lights, I will say there's a weird coincidence with Sasquatch and these lights. A lot of times when people see these weird lights, they'll also see these weird cryptids running around. I know that wasn't the case in your situation, uh, but the lights, I'm telling you, man, they fascinate me. If you would, would you kind of start from the beginning, kind of tell us what you were doing and and what happened? Sure. So uh, I have what, what's it's made by a company called Ring. It's a, like a security camera that's motion activated, and it has two big LED flat, uh, floodlights on it on the back of my shop wall. And uh, I have we have it pretty well uh, adjusted to where it, it doesn't go off for like uh, squirrels or whatever. I live out in the country. Um, it's a couple miles to the nearest stop sign, and it's I'm at the very end of a of a gravel road, basically. So about four thirty in the morning here, a couple of months ago, um, my cell phone went off. I keep it on the nightstand next to me, and I was already about half awake. So I, the ring, what went off was the ring uh, alert. So I picked up my phone and turned on the app and. Uh, I see to me the the floodlights are on out behind my shop and out behind the shop I have a fifth wheel parked and I have a, a flatbed trailer and then there's a little uh, a tractor and there's a gravel roll road gravel driveway that want if you're standing out there looking at it it wanders off to about two o'clock to leave the property well it looked to me like there was a a man carrying a very bright LED flashlight walking up the grade onto the pad where the trailers are. It was extremely bright. And th- that was the only thing that made any sense was, Hey, somebody's, uh, somebody's walking up the driveway up, up the back driveway with a flashlight. So, uh, when I first saw it, it was far enough away to where the LEDs weren't putting any, the floodlights weren't putting any, putting any light behind it. And then as it got closer to about to where the fifth wheel is, there was light behind it. I could see that there was nobody holding a flashlight, that this thing was uh, independent. As I'm, as I'm drawing all this in, I'm trying to think, okay, what is, what the hell's going on here? Is this a, is this a drone or what? And at some point in time, this thing went up in the air. It was to about the level, I'm going to say 15 feet because my, my fifth wheel's a little over 13 feet tall. And it turned on another light that was pointing towards the ground. Now, Wes, this, this second light, the only way I know to describe it is if you, uh, if you had an old cheap plastic flashlight with the lenses, uh, lenses that always get yellow, do you remember those things? Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you had one of those and it had two bad D-cell batteries in it pointing straight to the ground, that is the color of the light that was coming out of the bottom of this thing. It, it, that wasn't the intensity, but that was the color, just kind of that yellow as opposed to the bright LEDs that the floodlight was putting on and it, that the main light thing was making. So this, this thing with its uh, searchlight, that's what I'm going to call it, goes down the, the right side of the roof, the edge of the roof of my fifth wheel. And then it moves over and goes down the other side of the fifth wheel. And then it moves a little further away from me, like it's examining my flatbed car trailer that's parked out there. And then it comes back around and it's just moving around by the front of the trailer. Well, at this point in time, 
my by now my wife is has woke up because the my phone is so bright you know and the, when it's in the dark it woke her up i'm saying look at this thing look at this and she's looking at it and she goes what is that and i told her at this point in time i had come to the conclusion that this was a drone that somebody was flying a drone on my property and like you said in the intro i'm a retired peace officer and that raised my hackles pretty good so i uh I armed myself and I grabbed a flashlight and I handed my phone to my wife and I said, here, you hang on to this. I'll watch this. I'm going to go outside and see what in the heck is going, what's going on. So, uh, I went out the front door of the house and went to the left and out across the driveway and some grass. But before I got to where the floodlights picked me up and I was visible, I stayed in the dark and I stopped about 20 feet away from the light uh, lighted area and just listened for a few minutes thinking I'm going to hear a drone because every drone I've ever been ever around ever been around is loud really loud they make that you know humming noise and, and the propel the rotors well I didn't hear anything it was absolutely silent we had had a earlier in the night a storm had come through and it was stone quiet other than I could hear water dripping off uh, trees and leaves and what have you i didn't hear anything so i walked around the corner and i didn't see anything and i spent about i don't know five or ten minutes out there i walked around down the, to the end of the shop because there's a enough room at the other end of the shop where you could drive a car through there and i looked down there with my flashlight and without and looked around and the, it wasn't over there and i went around the other side of the fifth wheel around where the car trailer is and there was nothing over there and came back to where the tractors parked. And I, I stood there for probably five or 10 minutes, just looking and listening. I figured that if it had been a drone, that it was somebody was operating it from somewhere and that I might hear a car start up, you know, and here, because this is out in the sticks. I know you've been out in the country enough to know you can you know sound carries a long way i figured i'd either hear the drone or hear a car start up and hear somebody leave in the area well i didn't hear anything so after about 10 minutes i come back in the house and walk in the bedroom and my wife is uh pretty pretty wound up she goes she's saying uh you didn't hear me you didn't hear me talking to you that thing when you came around the corner or that thing when you went over and stood by the tractor it flew over and went right up over your head and put that yellow light right on top of your head. Didn't you hear me telling you that? Well, I didn't hear. These these ring things have a, like, talk to the delivery man feature. But she didn't know how to use it. She'd seen me do it, but she didn't know how to use it. So she just started talking and assumed that I would hear it. But I'd never shown her how to use the app. And I said, no, baby, I didn't hear, I didn't hear a word. And she said, well, it's still out there right now, Jeff. So she handed me my phone again, and we watched the thing for another 10 minutes or so uh, anyway. And it was still out there, but I never saw it, Wes. I never saw it. We watched it for probably a total of, I would say, 15 minutes or so. And at that point in time, uh, I tried to shut it off. I shut it off, but it immediately the uh, the app reacted again so whatever this thing was 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 uh, solid or whatever you want to call it enough to uh, make the motion sensors go off it got to the point where I just I shut the system down to go back to sleep because I didn't know what else to do I, I mean I couldn't see it uh, I don't know how you fight what you can't see and I ran, I ran a story by a couple of people, and they're all saying drone, 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 drone. And I said, yeah, but I've never, I don't know of any invis invisible drones, and I don't know of any, you know, uh, stealth drones that are stone quiet. And why would one of them be flying around out on my property? <laughs> yeah, so, it's, um, it's weird. I, I mean, I would think drone too. When I, you know, when if someone explained to me what you were seeing, I've seen the lights, so I, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, and drones are loud, you know, and these things make no yeah. noise, but they put off this, uh, it's a really bizarre light. It's really hard to describe and it's spooky when they're around, you know, it's like, what, what do you, you can't, sh what are you going to do? Shoot it? You know what I mean? I, I guess you could, but is a bullet really going to do anything? 
what do you think those lights are, Jeff? I mean, what's kind of, I know you've listened to the show and everything. What's kind of your opinion as far as the lights go? I, I don't have any idea. I know, you know, I can tell you this, whatever I encountered out there, whatever was flying around my place, based on what we saw on the camera and what my wife says she saw after I was out there, it's clearly intelligently controlled. You know, I worried for the next day or two, what the heck the thing, you know, the light was pointing right on top of my head. I wondered what the heck it had done to me. Well, it didn't do anything to me, but they're clearly, it's clearly in something that's, you know, it controlled by something. It's just not a random, uh, it's not a random event. How's that? No, I agree with you. I agree with you. Even on the light that I saw, and it eventually, I always say it chased us, and I think people get the impression it was like high-speed chase. It wasn't like that. But it, it when we were leading, it was like, oh, it's following us. Oh, it's still there. It's still there. Yeah. Um, and like a drone, exactly like a drone. I mean, it very intelligently controlled, except for it's not a drone. It's just a weird ball of light that flies around. And it's bizarre. I, every part of the country, people will talk about these balls of light. I think more people have seen the balls of light than they have Sasquatch. You know, I've, I've gotten more reports over the lights. And I didn't, at the time, this is years ago, I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I, don't, I didn't realize so many people were seeing these balls of light flying around. Do you think it's more, like alien? Do you think it's more demonic? Or do you not really have an opinion one way or another? And that's okay, too. I just, I don't, I don't have enough... I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't, t I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a bet either way. I just don't know. I don't know. I think, uh, you know, that's the first time I've ever run into anything like that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know that there's evil in the world. I dealt with it in my profession, but I, I have no idea what, what that thing was. And I was, I sure hope that if there's anybody else out there that listens to this, that's had something like this happen that you call, you let Wes know because uh, I'm, I'm at a loss. This was two months ago and I still think about it, you know? Yeah. I would love to know what the lights are. Like I said, it's, it's a coincidence that these lights are around when these creatures are around, not always, but they do seem to show up a lot, a lot of times with the lights, which I, I find bizarre. I know you've listened to the show for a while, Jeff. I want to ask you about uh, being a police officer, but, before we get into that, what do you think that Sasquatch is? I'm just kind of curious on your personal opinion. Uh, you know, I, it, it, I, I go, here's my opinion. Based on everything that I have heard on your show and everything I've read in, the, in your forum, being a member, and the research that I've done on it, I, I think that we, have, we may have more than one, one entity, one, one thing happening here. I'm not convinced that what what we lump into sasquatch is one thing you know i think there's too many variables we have we have them that are that look very different we have them that uh that sound different that act different we have people who've had encounters that are that are uh, benign and that are 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 not benign and bordering on violent and I'm just not convinced of what we're what we're we're lumping into the uh, under the heading of Sasquatch is is one thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does, and it's a good point. I, yeah, I think that I think that we could have uh, we may have something that's that's paranormal. We may indeed have a a a biological creature out there, and we may have something else. But there's just too much of a vari variance in the. Uh, and what we hear to say, yeah, this is this is what it is, and leave it at that. It, it, that's yeah. at least that's the way I see it. No, and I tend to agree with you. I mean, even your normal animals that we know about, uh, for the most part, they're predictable. I mean, you're, you 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 kind of know what you're going to get. Yeah. Um, and with these things, you're right. It's so unpredictable, and that's why I tell people, you know, treat it like you would a bear. You're not going to run up on a bear. You're not going to provoke a bear. You're going to try and leave as quickly as possible and try and be predictable in that, that way, because who knows what this thing's going to do, uh, because they can be very, you know, where they'll just get up and walk off. And then there's other occasions where they don't get up and walk off. And it's like, they want to yeah. fight, you know? 
well, you know, you take your, your, your situation, what happened to you? And then you, you take the, the ones where people just see them run across a road or you see, you have one that a person just uh, sees run across a pasture. And then you've had people on that have had, that have farms that have lost livestock. Or you had that lady that was from, uh, I think she was from the UK that saw him on the beach yeah, up uh, near you. There's way, you know, we're talking about a, a lot of uh, variables. And I, so that just makes, yeah, the right, the smart thing to do is, is, uh, is avoid them. I think, you know, I think you gotta be, you have to be pretty sure of yourself and have your uh, ducks in a row. If you're going to go out and uh, attempt to uh, research these creatures, because I think that, I don't think there's any guarantee that what you think you're going to run to is what you're actually going to run into. Yeah, no doubt about that. It's a great answer. And I've often thought that too. I've often thought about what you, one thing you said that really sticks to me is the, um, or sticks with me is the, uh, the, we may be dealing with many different things here because it's not, you know, you can kind of know how a cougar is going to react. You can kind of know how a bear is going to react. Yep. There's always one-off situations, but even in your one-off situations, you can read it. I can tell you, a black bear is going to run from you. Now, if a black bear has cubs, you're in trouble. She's not. She's yeah, not exactly. going to run from you. Yeah. Exactly. There's some pretty standard ways to, to to deal with those, but with this with Sasquatch, I don't think they. I don't think we. You'd be. You'd have to be pretty bold to say these are the standard procedures. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to be almost delusional to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I know I mentioned in, in the beginning that you were a police officer for many years. And again, thank you for your service. They couldn't pay me enough today to do that job. Um, but, you know, when out of all the years of doing it, I'm sure you have many stories. Is there one that kind of sticks with you as far as a, maybe a call you went to or some sort of experience you had on the job? Yeah, I got I got a couple of them I'll, I'll share with you. They both happened in the same at the same place. I don't want to get real specific, but, uh, the, in the place, but this, uh, this area is, this place is of historical interest and it's, uh, it's managed by a, a, a state agency. And at the time this, 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 uh, first in- incident happened, it was, uh, not open to the public. It was kind of in, it was just sitting there and this is a big house. That's all, that's as close as I'll get to identifying it. It's a very large, uh, old home. And I was on patrol. I'd been on, this was a graveyard shift. And in this area, at that point in time, there were two officers on graveyards. I'd been on the road for a couple of years. And my partner that night had a canine, a big, big uh, German shepherd male. And I'd been around the dog a lot. And the dog was absolutely fearless. And we got an alarm call one night. Our dispatcher, uh, we had a scrambled channel at the time that, kept uh, scanners from picking us up and a dispatcher came up and said, Hey, uh, this other agency doesn't have anybody around. And they've got a motion sensor, silent motion sensor alarm out at this place. And they're wondering if we check on it. Well, you know, cops like silent alarms because that means we get a chance to catch the bad guy. People like loud audible alarms because it makes the bad guy run away. So it makes, that makes perfect sense. But we were, uh, tickled that this was a, a silent and it was multiple motion sensors on a set of stairs. You follow me? Mo- somebody's going upstairs yeah. and they're hitting, hitting motion pads. It's almost like someone's robbing the place. They don't Somebody's realize. walking up the stairs yeah. what, what it's doing. So we came up with a plan. We uh, parked about 200 yards away from this place in the dark, got the dog and we'd been told where uh, the, uh, a hidey key was to get in the back door and the only light there's no electricity in this house at the time and the only light was an old really old school like 40 watt porch light bulb on the back door so we went to the back door found the hidey key and we got the alarm code so i walked we walked in and we shut the uh shut the alarm down while we were doing our sweep so we went through the downstairs area and uh, nothing. And this was this is a big building. There's rooms everywhere. And we we uh, secured the the downstairs rooms before we went upstairs. And then we went upstairs and went room to room, 
clearing the rooms and announcing ourselves at every room. Uh, police department, you know, if you're in there, come out now. We have a canine. It would be better if you come out now. And no answer, no answer. And all the doors were open to these rooms. We come to the last room and uh, the door is locked. So we're thinking, okay, they're in there. This is the room they're hiding in. So uh, the same announcement, police department, we know you're in there. We need you to come out. Come out now or, you know, there's going to be an issue. No response. So I pulled a credit card out of my wallet and I slipped the door lock. And uh, we opened the door. And Wes, this was, let me paint this picture for you. This was summer. It was probably uh, still 75 degrees outside at, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning. We're wearing old style body armor. And this building was closed up tight. And it was like walking into a blast furnace when we went inside it. We were sweating, just sweat rolling off us by the time we opened this door. When we opened that door, it was like walking into a deep freeze, a walk-in freezer. You know, both of us felt the cold hit. Same thing. Sheriff's office, we went to back to the routine. Sheriff's office, come in or we're going to send in the dog. And at that point, my partner... He had a way, what they did was they call it barked up the dog. So, you know, a lot of people say you got a dog, say they got a dog, but the best way to prove it is to let them hear the dog. So he had the dog bark, which would have brought any sane human being singing, I'm right here, come get me. No response. So being the junior guy, I got I get sent into the room. Now, this is about a probably... 14 by 16 or 14 by 18 room and it's upstairs and the roof is uh it's up on top so the roof is angled you know one and the ceiling in one side of the room is like five feet tall and then the other side of the room it's 10 feet tall it's open beam in the middle of the room were five or six of these uh, clothing racks with wheels on them you know what i'm talking about they're if you're a gro in a clothing store, you see clothes that are rolling around to put oh, out yeah. for sale. Yeah. So there's three or four of these in the middle of this room with old clothing on them. So we can't see the whole entire interior of the room. So I, being the junior guy, I make entry into the room and uh, I go around and I search the whole room. And it's the whole time I'm in there, I can see my breath. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a hundred it's a hundred degrees everywhere else in that house. And in this room, I can see my breath. I went from ringing wet with sweat to cold in 10 seconds. Yeah. So, so we get to the other, I get to the other side of the back to the door and, uh, my partner stand there and his flashlights on and we were carrying, uh, standard cop flashlights for the day, Streamlight SL20s, they're rechargeable lights. And we had chargers in the car, so the lights were always, they're always charged up. Within about 10 seconds, both of our flashlights went dead. It's pitch black in the room, but we both carried little backup lights with, uh, with regular D-cell, or actually ours were double A's in them. So uh, I told him, I said, there's nobody in here. The dog would not cross the threshold, Wes. The dog stood at the door. We were going to send the dog in. This is what I didn't tell you first. We were going to send the dog in before we went in because we didn't know what was in there, right, or who was in there. The dog's hackles were up on his back. His teeth were barred, and he would not make entry into that room. Which makes no sense for those dogs because they're trained to do that, you know. This dog would absolutely went nuts any time he got a chance to put the bite on somebody. He lived for those moments. He lived for responding to the, I, I've, worn, I've worn the sleeve for him before in training. And he was an incredible canine. He would not go across the threshold. So that's why I went in and made the search. And I came back and I tell my partner, he's the senior guy, said, hey man, there ain't nobody in here, but can you feel that cold? He goes, oh, yeah, absolutely. And then about that time, both our lights went, Within 15 seconds, both our lights. The thing with those old stream lights is when they went out, they didn't give you much warning. They went from on to 
off. Oh no. And then yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so what happened then is we, uh, you know, we went back down the stairs, we cleared the building. There was nobody in there except for that room. We went back downstairs and there was a phone on the wall there. So I called my dispatcher and said, get the, get the alarm company on the phone and get the, get their, their dispatch for this other agency on a conference. So I got, we got them all three on the phone. I said, Hey, you know, we just cleared this building. I didn't say anything about that room upstairs. I just said, we've cleared this building. We're going to reset the alarm and go outside and, and leave, you know? And they're, well, thank you very much, et cetera. So we, that's what we did. I reset the alarm. We went out the door, locked it, put the hide key back, and we walked back down to the cars. And we're standing there discussing what we had just experienced. And my dispatcher hits me on the scramble channel on my handset again and said, uh, it's going, the alarm's going off again, same place. Motion sensors, staircase. So we went back and repeated this same process in the exact same order, except the door to that room was not closed. It was open the way we'd left it. And it was hot in there. That's insane. And I'm sure you know at this point, a lot of times with ghost or poltergeist or whatever, people will describe it being cold. I've even seen guys do on different investigations where they'll walk in, you can see their breath, but they'll show you the temperature of everywhere else in the house. And it's like 75, 80 degrees and bam, it drops to some crazy, crazy temperature. Did, did, did that ever go off again? I mean, were you ever called no. out to this place again? No, no. But when we, we got, we were on graveyard, right? We got off at 7.30, oh, 7.30. So I, I left a note. Actually, I told the oncoming day shift sergeant, I said, hey, call this agency, have their guy contact their alarm company and send them out there to check this freaking alarm and make sure it's not. You know, so there's not something wrong with it because I'll be candid with you. Probably 70% of the alarm calls we, we roll to are, uh, malfunctions or, or owner operator. So we didn't take them very seriously, but my partner had been with the agency for over 10 years and he never had, he didn't even know the place was alarmed. He had never gone off. And then when, when I got back to work for graves again that night, there's a note there from the sergeant. He says, Hey, Alarm company checked it out. It's all well and good. So now fast forward, probably seven years, eight years. And, uh, this is in a, this place is in a, uh, area that we patrol. Okay. And there, there's a large gate big enough to put two semis through next to each other. That's normally open, uh, during, uh, the hours that the facility was open, but that building was still closed. Okay. But the facility is open for tours of his because it's a historical place. And this gate is always closed at night. Well, I roll by there and spotlight the gate and it's open. So I get out of my patrol car, tell them, dispatch, hey, I'm going to check and see what's going on. Once in a blue moon, there'd be somebody working there late at night doing maintenance on something. But this, this wasn't that not one of those nights. So I walk in and... I see to my, I look to my right and there's a light on. They have a, a, a room inside there that they show a, a film about the historical significance of this building. And I've, I've taken my family there, you know, I used to take, well, I used to take my kids there when they were young. So I, I knew the layout of the place and I, they've sat there and watched that film. Well, the light was on in there. So I walked down there and I looked in the door. And what I saw, this is a little difficult to, to say because I know it's difficult to believe. What I saw was somebody I thought was what they call a docent, which is somebody that volunteers at the facility and dresses up in period clothing and, uh, you know, gives tours and turns the projector on and that stuff. I, saw, I thought I saw a female standing against the wall in there that uh, was dressed like a docent, you know? And I thought, man, it's one o'clock in the morning. There's no cars out in the parking lot. You know, what, what, what's she doing here? So I tap on the glass, the window on the door, and she turns and looks at me and turns around and disappears into the wall. Jeez. I'm not, this is, this is a hundred percent truth, man. No, I believe you. 
And I have a witness because I immediately got on my handset and I had a partner on and I said, I called a, a guy who I've been, you know, uh, very good friends with and worked very well together for 20 plus years. I called him on the radio. I said, Hey man, get your, get your butt up here. So uh, he came up and I told him, you meet me at the corner of the building there. I got, there's no lights on, you know, and I'm darked out, but I'll, 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 uh, I'll let you know when you're close. So he comes walking up and I say, Hey man, I said, do me a favor, go down and look in the window there to that room and tell me if you see a, a docent standing there. And he goes, there's nobody up here now, man. What do you do? I said, just do what I'm asking you to. He goes down there. He looks in the window, turns back and looks at me and says, yeah, she's there. And he turns back and looks again. And the color just drained completely out of his face because I can see it in the glow from the light in the coming out of the room on him. And he goes, exclaimed a couple profanities and said, she's gone, man. I said, I know. I just saw the same. I just saw the same thing. That's my, that's my great story. I always thought I, I, I needed to call one of those ghost hunting shows and turn them on to this place, but it's got a lot of historical significance. I don't want to give the place up because. Yeah, you don't, and you don't have to. I'm curious when you first went into the place, did you get any sort of sense? I realize you guys are all focused on, we got to clear the house, but was there any sense when you first walked into it? Like nothing, nothing, huh? Wow. It was just an old, nasty, very hot, musty, smelled like uh, mothballs. You know, there was uh, the place, there was old furniture in there. The place has now been fixed up and is, is they do tours in there. But there wasn't even electricity other than the alarm in there. This place had been, uh, nobody's lived, actually physically lived in it in over 100 years. So, uh, yeah, I got, we got no sense of anything until we got, till we got to that door and well, no, really until we opened it and then got hit by that wall of, you know, cold. And then when the, and then when we did the, went through the routine with the dog and my partner, you know, po- takes the, uh, the, the leash off of him and says, search. And the dog, we t- the dog doesn't move. We put our lights down and look at him and, his hackles are up on his back. His ears are pointing straight forward and he's got his teeth barred, but he won't go across the threshold of the room. That's when we thought there's something, something ain't right here. You know, it's weird for how intelligent we are as humans. And we think that we're, we're the top of the game of everything. Uh, it's always odd with animals. I always wonder if different animals can see ghosts, demons, whatever you want to call them. Uh, because they seem in a lot of encounters I've heard, it seems like the dog will start barking at something or the cat will, and they're yeah. focused on what they're, um, and you know, regular, uh, we haven't seen anything yet. You know, it almost makes me wonder if they can see into that realm or, uh, I don't, I don't know if they can see, but I know they can smell. And I think that, you know, that's, you know, this dog was an incredible tracking dog just incredible and i think uh, my i kind of think i wondered about that for a long time after that we you know we, we handled that thing and i i i think that it's a scent with a dog anyway who knows but i do know they can smell so it makes makes you think right off the bat well what maybe they can smell something let me ask you have yeah. you ever gone back to that place i mean now that you're not not in law enforcement and talk to whoever runs it and just see if anyone else ever experienced anything odd there, or do you think maybe that's a bad idea bringing up something that happened while you're on the job? No, uh, to be honest with you, after I had retired, I ran into a guy who is currently employed with the agency responsible for security at that facility at the gym. And I told him the story and I said, Hey man, uh, you know, has anybody ever had any issues there? And he kind of looked, he looked at me like I was, uh, you know, and he just kind of said, no, no, uh-uh. And I said, well, you know, I was thinking about calling one of these uh, teams, you know, and saying, hey, you know, you really ought to go check this place out. And at that point, he said, I really wish you wouldn't do that. Yeah. So I left So I left it at that. But uh, he, the way he responded, you know, I'm a, in, the, in my business, your, uh, your ability to read people is pretty important. And I think, I think maybe he knew more than he was saying. And he probably was under direction not to uh not to not to cross that threshold and talk about that stuff 
some people think it's bad for business. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, and but the thing is, today, by, when I had this conversation, that would, the TV shows were all the rage, and I think that the, they would have been inundated up there with more people than that they're they're uh, able to handle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because uh, uh, so yeah, we've had a couple of those shows in in the in the, one of the towns here, and that was the re- the result. So. Yeah, it's it's fascinating account. You know that that always like the story of Robert. You know the show I did a couple uh, episodes yeah. ago. Um, there's more that goes on in this world than I think most people realize. You know, and and what's going on. You know, people can argue all day long, but there's weird stuff going on. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating, man. I, it takes big balls to go into there too. You know, because you guys could have been walking into a trap. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, Even, you know, if it was people, I mean. Yeah, well, and that's and that's exactly you know you pay attention to that. That's part of that's part of the job. You pay attention to that. You you have to trust the people you work with, and trust your training, and do your job. And uh, but I've never I you know that like I said that that incident at that at that building was uh, the first one was fairly early in my career. I'm going to say I started in uh, about 1980. And I'm going to say that was probably 84, 85. And I'm, I didn't, I did not run into anything quite like that ever again. Yeah. It's terrifying so, though. It's a little spooky, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It was spooky. Yeah. It got spookier when we had time to reflect and think about it. When you're physically doing it, you're pretty focused. I would you know? imagine. I yeah. Would imagine. You're pretty focused on what you're doing. Yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, share what happened with you with the light. It, you know, and the ghost story obviously is is very fascinating. You have to let me know if that light shows up again. Do you guys still have the ring, uh, the ring uh, thing on the doors? Yes, we do. And to this day, we both, when we go to bed at night, both of our phones are on. So if it happens again, our plan is for my wife to use her phone to record the video that my phone picks up. Because we don't pay, that's the reason we didn't have it recorded, or I would have been able to send it to you, is because we don't pay the, the company to uh to uh monitor the system because our internet's so crummy out here in the where we live that it, it you know the odds are it's not going to be working the moment uh something happens so yeah please do i'd be real curious if it if it does come back and- you'll hear from me and like i said if it please anybody that's listening out there if this, something like this has happened to you i'd sure like you to tell wes so he can share it with us because this this one's going to have me scratching my head for a long time no, I understand the feeling. Trust me. I understand the feeling firsthand. I know you do, man. Uh, but I appreciate you taking the time to come on. I sure appreciate your service. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you. You take care. Welcome to the show, Bo Kennedy from The Bump Podcast. Uh, If you get a chance, if you're on iTunes, whatever podcast player really you're listening to, uh, check it out, The Bump Podcast, and I'll include a link to as well. Uh, Bo, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, thanks, Wes, for having me, man. Uh, I'm actually, this is my first time being a guest on a podcast, so I'm kind of (laughs) nervous, but uh, this is a lot of fun. I appreciate you letting me come on. Yeah, no, I appreciate you being here, and there's no reason to uh, to be nervous. You know, we'll talk a little bit about the podcast, but uh, the first thing I wanted to get into was your experiences, because I know you had a couple of them out there in uh, West Virginia, and I'll kind of let you take it away, Bo. Kind of tell us what you were doing and, and walk us into your, your first encounter. Okay, sure. Um, well, if I go all the way back to, like, my high school days, I had uh, little things go on that I didn't, I never associated with, you know, Sasquatch or Bigfoot until I started listening to your show and started learning, you know, what behaviors and stuff might have been like. But my brother and I, we had to walk down past this mountain going to our bus stop as kids. And we had that typical pacing, you know, something following us in the mountain step for step. If we ran, it ran. If we walked, it walked. And if we suddenly stopped, it would take, you know, one or two more steps and then it would stop. Um, back then we just thought, you know, it might be a panther or something like that, uh, which isn't supposed to be here either. But, you know, Bigfoot never crossed my mind, but 
there was that. When I was hunting, probably my around my senior year of high school in the late 90s, I went out with my stepfather and we were going up. We had just got to the foot of the mountain and we heard this strange scream. Um, I don't really want to scream on the <laughs> on the show here, but yeah. it was a scream. It was a scream followed up by like a sigh after after each scream. So it was kind of like ah, ah, and it would do that about four or five times, not really elongated, just a big solid scream, and then like a sighing noise, like it was almost hurt. That stopped the hunting trip right there on the spot. We both just looked at each other and turned around and walked back to the house. But not a lot happened between then and what I messaged you about in 2018. Before you jump into that one, I was kind of curious if um, it was a sigh you heard or if it was taking breathing in that air again. That you know, because they're so their lungs are so any sort of noise they make, it's over exaggerated as opposed to what we would do. You know what I mean? Or do you think it was a sigh? I mean, you were there. Well, I wasn't. Well, it, the, the way the the tone kind of descended, you know, it sounded like it's been running out of breath, but, you know, it could have been an inhale. I don't know. Um, I never even thought about that. I could see why it would end a hunting trip pretty quick. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I probably would have left too. And, you know, it's, it's always fascinating to hear of hunters doing that because, you know, for the most part, I'm not saying every hunter is some expert survivalist, but you're out there so much that, you know, the first time you hear a fox, it will rattle you, you know, because they make weird noises, you know, at, especially at night or if they're in heat or whatever else, you know, most of the animals make bizarre noises uh, oh, yeah. out in the woods. You know, the coyotes have make noises most people wouldn't believe as a coyote, you know, they, right. um, but tell me about the 2018, what happened when you were out there? Sure. Yeah. Um, it was September 24th, I believe 2018. And again, I was just going squirrel hunting. Um, on a wildlife management area here in Logan, West Virginia. There's only one, so whoever might be familiar with the area knows where I'm talking about. Uh, I went out there, and it started to rain, and I just decided to wait it out. So I was sitting there in my hunting spot, and a squirrel comes out, you know, as the rain starts to lighten up a little bit. So I, I shoot it, and instead of going after it immediately, I decided to wait a few minutes to see if anything else might show up. After the rain tapered off, I went ahead and went out there and got my squirrel. And on the hill behind me, it's kind of like a little flat back there. I, I heard what sounded like a woman kind of like uh, like giggling or talking. It sounded real feminine, though. Um, and like I said, I'm out there hunting. I'm in the middle of nowhere in the rain. So it kind of struck me as odd, you know, but I... I just kind of glanced around, didn't see nothing. And a few minutes later, I hear what sounded like like an oof kind of noise. Like maybe if you fall on your butt or if you, or the sound you make if you throw something really hard. And as I heard that noise, I was already on alert, you know, from hearing the, the, the noise. I turned around. And as I turned around, I heard a thump, like something hitting the ground. But... It was a real steep hill behind me. So when I looked, I'm looking uphill and I hear that thumping sound and my eyes catch a tree branch kind of helicopter and down toward me. Um, it went off to my to my right hand side, but I didn't see anything. I just heard the noise and the way the branch was falling, you could tell it wasn't just free falling. You know, it had momentum, like it had been hit or maybe that was what was thrown. Um, it wasn't a huge branch. It was about the size of my wrist, probably four or five feet long. But after after I was witnessed that, I stood up, pulled my camera out because I'm already interested in, you know, the subject, obviously. But I started filming around the hill so I could review it later. Never did see anything, never heard anything else. Um, I gave it about 15, 20 minutes and you know, took my squirrel to the house. Yeah, the the woman screaming or the woman laughing, uh, you know, I, I've had many reports of what people will describe as children laughing out in the woods. Uh, it sounds like two kids laughing. Did it sound human? I mean, what you heard, did it sound human or did it sound off? Well, yeah, it sounded pretty much human. And I, like I told you, we talked yesterday and I said, I don't want to sound like I'm 
not PC or I'm profiling or something, but it sounded kind of like an Asian lady. You know, it, it, there was like a, a tone, you know, like an Asian accent to the to the sound. I don't know why I thought that, but that's just what it sounded like to me. Yeah, it's bizarre. That even the when you hear like the Sierra sounds, it, it it does kind of have a almost kind of a weird Asian tone to it. Well, I guess that's <laughs> why we call it the samurai chatter, you know. Well, um, yeah, yeah. So you go on and you have these experiences. Do you still go out hunting? Absolutely. Um, I don't get very many chances lately. I've been pretty busy at home, but uh, yeah, it it didn't stop me from going hunting or anything because. You know, the, our area is just always something weird going on. It, it's something common people talk about, you know. Um, the area I was in, West, um, it's connected to Chief Logan State Park in West Virginia. It's a, it's a state park that I worked at. I was working there when that happened. But the the park is actually mentioned in a book that I read by Russ Jones, I think is his name, Um he, he's with the BFRO. Apparently, he had come down here on a couple of account uh, accounts, you know, to come check things out. So I wasn't the only person that's experienced something down here. When you worked at the state park, did you ever have anyone come to you with any sort of experience or anything? Well, I had my own experiences there. Um, I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> We've had several people say that they heard, like, a howl or a scream and stuff like that there. But personally, uh, I was working there. It was around 2015, 2016. And I've had several things happen. One, I worked at a wildlife exhibit. It's about a mile up into the park. Uh, There's nothing else around there. It's just a little single lane road that goes back here to the wildlife exhibit. And I would take care of the animals. We had black bears, wild boars, bobcats, um, a couple of owls, and just, you know, local wildlife on exhibit. So I would I would feed them, and then the rest of my day, I just sat there in the woods and took admission when people would come up. I loved it. It was, <laughs> it was a, a really peaceful job. But almost every day back there, uh, I'd hear trees falling nearby. And as much time as I spent in the woods at that time, it was just odd. It didn't happen anywhere else in the in the park. But um, there was a lot of tree falls. There was a lot of owl calls. Now, I had an owl in the exhibit, so I kind of brushed it off as maybe it was some kind of mating call. But there would be days at 1 or 2 in the afternoon where I'd have owl sounds coming from three or four different locations at one time, which kind of struck me as odd. I was hiking. I was doing a litter pickup on one of our hiking trails and I heard that Ohio how sound definitive. There's no doubt in my mind. That's what it was. Um, it sounded like it was on the next ridge over, but it was just that, that long, slow, almost like a siren kind of sound. Yeah. That's spooky. I've never heard that in person. I mean, it's, it's bizarre when you hear it from the recording. Yeah. Yeah. With no doubt in my mind. And, uh, you know, I still tried to make sense of it, although, you know, it gave me chills when I heard it, you know, but I still went through all the local bird calls and everything to make sure it wasn't anything weird. Um, I was nowhere near any kind of alarm, uh, no kind of siren. You, You wouldn't hear the local fire department if there was a siren going off. It was out there in the middle of nowhere. But there were two other incidents that I had that were the the most confusing out there at the state park. One, I was out there doing maintenance, cleaning out some of the the shelters that you could rent to have picnics and whatnot. And I'm running a leaf blower. And when I get to the corner, which is at the edge of the woods, there is this almost like a, a roar, I guess, almost like a scream roar that was so loud. I heard it over top of the leaf blower. And I'm in a covered shelter, so it's already echoing and stuff in there. But whatever this was, it just 
completely drowned out the sound of that leaf blower. It freaked me out a little bit. I'm not going to lie. I was by myself. So uh, that shelter didn't get, it didn't get as clean as it should have that day. You know, I just got to. Yeah. Especially, especially hearing it over a leaf blower. I mean, anyone that's ever run, you know, you know, ran a leaf blower, you can't hear anything, you know, when you're using it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the last one's kind of weird. I wouldn't even mention it if it wasn't for, you know, hearing stories from like Ron Moorhead talk about how he heard truck doors shutting and stuff like that when he was out in the middle of the woods. But when I was back at that wildlife exhibit, just w- on one occasion, I heard what sounded kind of like a, a hacksaw going through a hollow metal pipe. That's the only way I could think of it. It was a real metallic, scratchy, fast sound. And it just seemed to come out of nowhere. No explanation. I went to where the sound was coming from, and it sounded like it was just coming out of out of a tree. You know, like it must have just been like some kind of just weird audio. I, I had no explanation for it. What do you make of that, Bo? Because I've heard that many times from uh, eyewitnesses to where I just had a kid on. Uh, well, I say kid. He's you know in his twenties, but. Uh, a couple weeks ago, he was out there in his tent. They were going to go out and view the solar eclipse. Remember back, I think it was 2016. And he, he heard footsteps, he heard other things too as well. But he describes this bizarre metallic sound that he heard. And I've had other witnesses talk about that. What, what do you think that is? I have no idea. Um, unless I, there's a theory out there that I've heard people talk about that you know, Bigfoot can mimic sounds and unless he can mimic sounds and throw his voice, I don't know what that was. Um, I'm open to the idea of things being a little fringe, you know, a little out there, but I have no idea because it was so loud that, you know, it makes you almost want to look for like an amplifier or something, you know, it was, it was a loud noise. Yeah, it's strange. And I know that sound does bounce around in the forest, but you know, when you're hearing, hearing metallic sounds and um, it, it's, it's weird. It's, it's yeah. weird, man. Uh, what yeah. do you think that they are? What, Bo, what's your opinion? What do you think that Sasquatch is? Well, um, I used to think that it was Gigantopithecus, you know, the open and shut case. My dad and I used to talk about this all the time. And I thought for sure that's what it was. It just hasn't been recognized as still being around but i'm not sure anymore you know i've I've listened to your show for years and i've i've read a lot about it and thought a lot about it i I just i don't know i definitely believe like i said in in the fringe kind of things but i don't think that you know personally that sasquatch is necessarily some kind of supernatural being because it leaves footprints and it it's been seen eating and there's been young ones spotted. So I don't I don't think it's anything, you know, like a spirit. But I don't know. I, I know that there's been people cite, you know, like you've talked about the lights being seen with Sasquatch um, or, or around that same area, same time. And that, that just makes me think that maybe we're not the only thing or person that's interested in it. You know, maybe maybe something else is visiting to watch their activity also or i I don't really know man uh it's a tough question yeah it is it is it's a fun question though it's you know it's um you're right i mean uh, and i've thought about that too with the lights because there's some weird connection with the lights i don't want to say connection wrong word coincidence with the lights there's some bizarre coincidence with the lights what made you start the the bump podcast? Well, I've always been fascinated with the unexplained. When I was when I was in the Air Force, I was stationed in Louisiana, and me and a couple of my buddies, I decided to make a group, and I I called our group Bump, and we were going to go out and look for ghosts, and I named it Bump for the believers of the unexplained monsters and paranormal. I thought if I call it that, I can lump everything in there together. I could look for anything I want to look for and it'll fall under that umbrella. And, you know, we did that for a couple of years off and on more off than on. Um, never had anything too astounding. Um, but when I came back home, 
in 2009, I had a couple more paranormal experiences and started a Facebook page for it. As time went on, you know, podcasts become more and more popular. And I was wanting to go on. Actually, I had a list made for uh, Tony's show, The Confessionals, because, you know, this Sasquatch stuff, I didn't have anything concrete, you know, and I, I didn't think I'd have a good enough experience to call you about. But I had a lot of other just weird events that went on. I was just going to go ahead and compile a list and try to get on the confessionals. The confessionals? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question, though. He, uh, it's, it's a good show, and you know, he's, he's kind of laid back, seems like. Yeah, no, but, Tony's good people. I'm just teasing. I know, man. But, you know, as I sat here with this list, and I, I sent a couple of messages on Facebook, not trying to throw them under the bus, but you know, I didn't hear anything back right away. And then I got, you know, in the same situation everybody else is in where COVID hit and it it started me working from home. I had a little bit of downtime. So I thought I would give it a shot and do my own podcast. And I had a lot of support from family and friends right off the bat. Um, people wanted to do the show initially. And as of now, I'm, I'm closing in on about my, I think, episode 17, something like that, 17, 18. You know, uh, interviews are a little bit harder to come by, but I'm I'm hoping that things will pick back up soon. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, welcome to the uh, podcasting wor- world. I'll be the official official guy to welcome you to the podcasting world. Out of all yeah, those, oh, go ahead, Bo. Yeah, I was gonna say I appreciate it. You know, I'm just another big bald guy that <laughs> wants to wants to talk about weird shit. I guess, man. Yeah. Out of all those uh, 17 episodes, what is there one that kind of stands out to you as far as uh, was there an, it was it an encounter or just one that kind of stays with you? Well, yes. Um, as far as sticking to the the topic, the theme of Bigfoot, episode five, it's called Terror in the Ozarks, and uh, I've I've actually made friends with this guy now. He was he stays or he lives in Missouri. His name is Dennis, and he had an experience out there on the Ozark Trail or the Ozark Mountains that really made me stop and think about, you know, what Sasquatch might be. Uh, his his encounter story was absolutely terrifying. It was one of the scariest stories I've ever heard. But when he started, can you give us kind of the, like the cliff notes? You don't have to tell the whole sure. encounter, but just kind of the cliff notes of what happened. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Him and uh, a couple of family members, there was four of them in all, decided to go on this long hike. Um, they were they were training to go on to I think Alaska or something like that. They were they were planning on doing a big long long expedition. So they hiked, you know, seven or eight miles in and decided to set up camp. And he had a hammock that he was sleeping in. So he hands off his sidearm to one uh, two girls in a tent gives his machete to to somebody else in a different tent and he piles up in the hammock and they have uh sasquatch come into the camp and when it comes in it actually comes over beside him and puts his its hand under the hammock and screams into his ear and then goes about beating the trees with rocks and it stokes up the campfire and everybody gets a good you know good set of eyes on this thing and uh, just wreaks havoc and then walks off like a you know like nothing happened. I have to check that out. That was episode five. Yes, and he has a good theory about it. So yeah, I, I would love it if you listen to it. Um, I'm sure he'd be open to talking to you about it. He uh, my my podcast was the first interview he'd ever done. At that time, he hadn't even listened to podcasts. I don't think. But um, man, he he's a great guy to talk to. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have to definitely check it out. And for the audience out there, check out Bo's show, uh, The Bump Podcast. Whatever podcast player you're listening to, uh, go give them a listen. Uh, Bo, thanks again for coming on. Hey, thanks, Wes, so much. I appreciate that, man. Thanks again, Bo. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member 
and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone. Tiffany